Paula and Chrysostom and Didymus and all of these fathers of the church to, to absorb the scripture so well, to immerse themselves in the scripture, and to find those opportunities. They wanted to make it easy for us. But never apart from the liturgy. Never apart from the liturgy. The liturgy really uh, gives it rocket fuel. <laughs> that's, right, that's right. I know we're going to take a break. But when we come back, let's take a look at how the fathers did it and how we can still do it. I'd love to see to get into the methods. And I hope you'll join us for that discussion. Okay. Good morning, Jesse. How are you? Um, wow, I got really excited this week. Uh, because, quite frankly, I would say a high percentage, 85, 90 percent, of converts to the Catholic Church, one of the things that draws them in is starting to read the early fathers. And as you begin to, and it's just like Cardinal Newman said, St. Cardinal Newman now, he said, the further you go back in church history, the more you cease to be Protestant. And that's what shocked me. When I began to read those fathers and mothers that were writing about what the Mass was like in the years 200, 300, 400, it looked very Catholic to me. Very Catholic. And at that point, I was already Anglican. And then I began to realize, you know, this sheet that they, they uh, passed out here is really good. How did your church begin? I began to look at the roots of the Anglican church, and it was ugly. <laughs> Who started the Anglican church? Church of English. Henry VIII. Why? Why did he break with Rome? Yeah. Right. He he didn't he wanted another wife and then he wanted a, another wife. And that's how the Church of England began. And I'm thinking, why would I want to be a part of a church that began like that? Now they will tell you, the Anglicans, they will tell you, oh no, we've got a path all the way back to the original apostles and to Jesus. No, they don't. They'll tell you they do. But they don't. Well, that's what they always, it's that's what they always the church, Catholic Church. They always told us, but I think it was because it was Catholic. It had to do, but it took a hard left turn. It, it took a hard left turn. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, when these guys started today, my juices started flowing. On fire Catholics. These two. <laughs> and what are they trying to do with all of us? Get us on fire, too. It's not enough to be sparky. It's good to have a spark, but there has to be flames at some point for our faith. They didn't have any of the tools we have today. Oh my word! You can Google anything. Anything! And it'll come up for you. And that's why I want us to really think about what they're trying to motivate here today. A lot of ways to define the church and acknowledges who the church acknowledges as the early fathers. Scott said it this way. His vision is they are the fathers of the early church that our father used to reveal his beloved son to the early believers and to the world. That's a good way to talk about the early fathers of the church. We all know the patriarchs of the Old Testament, the fathers of the Old Testament, Adam, Noah, Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, on and on and on and on. And all these ancient fathers of the Old Covenant advanced and developed the faith of Israel. No doubt about it. In much the same way, the early fathers did the same in the New Covenant. Mike Aquilina has written books about both the early fathers of the church and I actually bought the one he wrote about the early mothers of the church. They're both on Kindle, 10 bucks a piece. They're a good read. Be, be something you might want to take a look at. Both Scott and Mike were amazed at Didymus the blind and what he was able to do in that time. Even as a blind believer, he was able to memorize great portions of the Bible. How? Simply by attending Mass. 
He was a student of origin, and he became one of the great early theologians with no special aids like Braille to help him. Scott mentions also St. John Chrysostom, who as a teenager went off to live in a cave on the top of a mountain. Why? Why did he go? To give himself completely to sacred scripture and to prayer. Think about that. How many teenagers you know that are headed for the caves? Yeah. And how about Monica, St. Augustine's mother? One of the early mothers of the church. Most church historians believe she was illiterate. But she was immersed in the sacred scriptures through the celebration of the Mass. She even attended all the funeral Masses she could go to just to hear the reading of the Word. Think about that passion. Wow. She could tell you the entire salvation story. Listen to me. Monica could tell you the entire salvation story from Genesis to Revelation. And she was illiterate. Why can't we do that? I mean, I'm listening to this going, we're going to have to step it up here. <laughs> we're going to have to take it to another level. Especially with what we have available for us today. No doubt about it. Wow. How many of us this morning could tell that same salvation story? Quoting from sacred scripture like she did. And she could not read or write. She's challenging me this morning. One phrase that was never spoken by the early fathers is, do we have to go to Mass? <laughs> they never said that. When do we get to go to Mass? And how long can we stay? As Scott said, they wanted to go to Mass to consume the Word and to be consumed by the Word. St. Jerome, considered a doctor of the church, sought out tutors to teach him the Hebrew language. And he followed that with great sacrifice, moving to Bethlehem, which is very close to Jerusalem, to sit under the teaching of Hebrew rabbis, just to try and master the ancient language and the Hebrew culture. He uprooted and went there to learn. And he's the one, Jesse, did he not? He wrote the Latin Old Testament, did he not? Vulgate. There's a funny the Vulgate. Story that one reason he went out to, he thought it would be an act of charity toward his neighbor because he was such a grouch, he thought, Lord, you probably want me to just go away and learn. So, so God used his weakness to help him to, to do what he did. He was a grouchy man. <laughs> in, in context, he's incredible because he gave us incredible explanations that assume. How many know God can use grouchy people? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> you really can. <laughs> Interestingly, Jerome's life was forever altered for the good by two women, mothers of the church, Marcella and Paula. Wow. <coughs> what they decided to pursue in their day and age was shocking, considering that women had very few educational personalities in those er, opportunities in those days. These two widows made up their hearts and minds to become well-versed in sacred scripture, so they pursued the best teacher in all of Jerusalem and Bethlehem. Guess who that was? <coughs> Grouchy old Jerome. The miracle is he agreed. He was not an easy man to get along with by reputation. And this was a game changer. And what really opened the door to women in this area and many others was the church establishing marriage as a sacrament. That's a world changer. From the point that all women were to be loved and honored at a much higher, higher level than any of, the, of what the world had seen up to this point. Before long, religious orders of both men and in their monasteries and women in their convents were on their way to becoming the norm throughout the church. Jerome was ultimately to become a member of the fellowship that was part of Marcella and Paula, with Jerome commenting that Marcella 
had become his slave driver. Why? They drove him by their questions to become an even greater scholar of the word. And they, in turn, learned to speak the Hebrew language like natives of Jerusalem, something Jerome never did to chief. He always sounded like he was from Nebraska uh. or Oklahoma. Once again, Christianity was and is unique. Thinking of the mothers of the church in the special place women were given in the church. Even today, look at the struggles of women in many of the Arab nations. Women are still fighting to be able to go to church, to, excuse me, school in places like Afghanistan. Saudi Arabia is just now giving women the right to drive a car. There is no Mother Angelica in Muslim nations. There's no Mother Teresa. Scott points out that the early mothers of the church were simply following the example of our Queen Mother, our Blessed Mother Mary, as they dedicated their lives to prayer and consuming the Word and being consumed by the Word. How? Through the Eucharist and their passion for the Bible, for the written sacred scripture. Mary's Magnificat. Listen to this. Where did Mary get that Magnificat? She got it from Hannah of the Old Testament, or at least a good book, a part of it. We're going to read it here in just a minute. It's patterned under Hannah, uh, after Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel, showing her passion for the Word of God. Mary had a passion for the Bible. Wow. She kept God's Word deep in her heart and pondered sacred words for her entire life on this earth. Here's what Hannah prayed over Samuel. Hannah also prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like you, Lord. There is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. That's a beautiful prayer. The barren have borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and He raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and He exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the dung heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them He has set the world he will guard the feet of his faithful ones. But the wicked shall he cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. Mary knew that prayer. She hid it in her heart. It was in her. And at the moment she began to bless the Lord, here's what she said. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For He has regarded the lowest state of His handmaiden. For behold, henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For He who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is His name. And His mercy is on those who fear Him from generation to generation. Don't you think she was thinking of Hannah when she prayed this? He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich He has sent 
empty away. That sounds like Hannah. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it? He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and his posterity forever. Thank you. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. Mary loved the Bible. Praise God. At this point, Scott encourages all Catholics to get excited about the liturgy, the catechism of the Catholic Church, and the Bible. And we have available to each of us in our time the best ch the church has ever had in her 2,000 year history. All of the early fathers and mothers are right at your fingertips on the internet. All you have to do is type them in. I don't want you to meet Didymus, the blind, in heaven and say, of course I'm sure he won't be blind anymore, and have him say, you know, you could have Googled me. You could have. I truly hope this class is not the only time you're reading and studying the Bible and the catechism during your week. This class is just a spark to get the fire going. OFC University on fire Catholics, not out of gas Catholics. Just last week, Scott was telling us of the mystagogy of the church, teaching the mysteries, the sacraments, is the fuel to get us to heaven and bring a whole lot of folks with us along the way. Fox News and CNN are not giving you words of life. They're not. And the ability to live our lives more like Jesus. St. Cardinal Henry, uh, Henry Newman said to go deep in the history of the church is to cease to be Protestant. And the more I, the deeper I went, the less Protestant I became. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's all dance. Next Saturday night. <laughs> wow. Reading the early fathers put a fire in the belly of many converts that, that became Catholic. It certainly did for Jackie and I. Most of the early fathers and mothers are also saints. And they dedicated their lives to prayer and consuming the Word. Again through the Eucharist and through consuming the Bible. Scott came into the church in 1986, one year after the great synod in Rome that began the great task of assembling a brand new catechism for all Catholics. Not just a regional catechism like the Baltimore Catechism. I've heard much of that, and a lot of people received so much through that catechism, no doubt. But this is a catechism that all Catholics can use around the world. And it really helps steer people through the understanding of what Vatican II was supposed to be all about. If you read the Catechism of the Catholic Church that was started in 85, was, was rough draft in 92, and then became published in 95, I believe, you will understand exactly what happened at Vatican II. And you will know the Catholic faith backwards and forwards, up and down. It's an incredible book. Second most beautiful book I've ever read. Mm. The process took seven years to get the rough draft. In the meantime, Scott is teaching. <laughs> Scott got himself in hot water. I really did not know this about him. Scott is teaching Catholic kids how to use the early fathers as an example of how to study the Bible with a fire and a compassion from his own study of the early fathers. He, he was not knowing it, but he was breaking new ground in Catholic education. And it got him in hot water. His supervisors told him, you can't do this anymore. Wow. Well, <clears throat> the Catechism of the Catholic Church came out a few years later, and guess what? Everything Scott was doing was vindicated by the catechism itself. So here's what he's talking about. This is right out of the catechism. And this is how we're supposed to be studying the Bible. This is how we're supposed to be teaching Catholic kids to study the Bible. So if you go to paragraph, I started two paragraphs earlier. 
Read the scripture with the living tradition of the Holy Church. That's what the Catechism says. According to the saying of the fathers, sacred scripture is written principally in the church's heart. <laughs> Do you hear that? According to the saying of the fathers, sacred scripture is written principally in the church's heart rather than the documents and records. For the church carries her tradition, the living memorial of God's word, and it is the Holy Spirit who gives her the spiritual interpretation of scripture according to the spiritual meaning which the Spirit grants to the church. It's a living word as well as a written word. And the reason the Catholic Church can teach it without error is because the Holy Spirit has revealed it to the church. Wow. It goes on. Be attentive to the analogy of faith. Analogy of faith, we mean the coherence of the truths of faith among themselves within the whole plan of salvation. So when you read the Bible, they're saying, first of all, understand how it has to deal with the faith of the Catholic Church, but also the story of salvation. It has a context. When you read the Scripture, your faith should be buoyed up. It should be increased. It should be agitated. Right? Your faith should be stirred. And once it is stirred, then you want to know how does this fit into our plan of salvation from Genesis to Revelation. According to ancient tradition, one can distinguish with two senses of Scripture, literal and spiritual. What does literal mean? Written basic understanding. You've heard people say, literally, that's what happened. So the, the scripture was written for a literal understanding at the moment it was written. It had an effect on what was going on at that time with real events, literal things that were going on. Right? Mm -hmm. But that's not the only sense of it. Literal and spiritual. The latter being subdivided into allegorical, moral, and anagogical senses. The profound concordance of the four senses guarantees all its richness to the living reading of the scripture of the church. And this is the way, this is the way Scott was doing it long before they could get out the catechism. But he was chastised for it. Right? And there was a reason for that. If I could give a little bit of context there. Right after Vatican II, there was this tendency, especially among some German scripture scholars, to deny those various senses of scripture that you see there, the allegorical, the moral, and the logical. Let's put those all together to simplify it in one term, typology. And we all know that. It, it sounds like a technical term, but in essence it means that the new is, uh, the new is for, or rather foreseen in the old, right? Things in the Old Testament, persons and places and things, point to people in the New, and we see that. Adam points to Jesus. Eve points to Mary. Um, the Sabbath meal, uh, the Passover, points to the Mass. That interaction between the Old and the New is pivotal, and we need to see the symbolism, how one points to the other. What happened right after Vatican II is that some scripture scholars, especially... Well, let me go back to the 19th century, before Vatican II. Some scripture scholars started to promote this heresy that you had to interpret scripture only in the literal sense. It's called form criticism. And its basic idea is that you look only at the literal meaning of what the scripture said about the specific time in which it was written. <coughs> so in other words, someone using that heresy would say, um, Okay, the virgin will be with child and bear a son. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. A heresy, the heresy in that would be to say that it pertained only to a specific person at the time in which Isaiah wrote it. It's an attempt to kind of gut the prophetic dimension and say, oh, you know, this really also points to Mary. 
you know. So you had these scriptural minimalists right after Vatican II, and I had some of them in the seminary who were proclaiming this. Now you can only take the literal sense. Thank God that Pope John Paul put his foot down and said, no, we have typology. We have persons and people and things in the Old Testament pointing to what is in the living. We can't just take one way of interpreting the scripture, the literal, and, and eradicate the rest. That's why Scott Hahn encountered this resistance. He wasn't encountering resistance from the Catholic Church. He was encountering resistance from heretics who were misinterpreting. And one of them to, happened to be a supervisor. A supervisor, yeah. And so now we're coming back to the... Now, hopefully Catholic. his supervisor got the knowledge at some point that, yes, this is the way the church needs to have it done. It's always been this way, going all... Oh, see, a lot of people think that <clears throat> Vatican didn't modernize the church. No, it didn't. It actually went back and went back to early sources of things. And, and in this case, they went back to how their early fathers taught people to study Scripture and understand Scripture. So we're going back and resourcing those ancient understandings that are still alive, part of the living tradition of the church. And now we have a catechism that said, here it is. Do it this way. And let's all do it this way. 16. 116. The literal sense is the meaning conveyed by the words of Scripture and discovered by exegesis. What is exegesis? How would you define it, Jesse? Exegesis is the attempt to look at the real meaning of uh, a passage of Scripture using typology, how, how the old points to the new. That's what scholars do when they, they break down what does this verse actually mean? And they look at all those senses of scriptures. They're exegeting that scripture. They're breaking it down to its full meaning. Far beyond what you're reading in just those number of words in that sentence, they are expanding it to everything they think is in there that they're trying to understand about that scripture. That's the literal sense. Following the rules of sound interpretation. All other senses of sacred scripture are based on the literal. So the literal has to be there as a base. And then it builds on top of that. Very important. The spiritual sense, <coughs> this is right out of our catechism, guys. The spiritual sense, thanks to the unity of God's plan, not only the text of scripture, but also the realities and events about which it speaks that can be signed. Signs do what? What's a sign for? If you see a stop sign, what is it signing? Guidance. Right. And stop. If you see a sign that says 500 miles to Denver, do you stop there? <coughs> Not unless you want to take a picture. It's a sign pointing to Denver, which is still 500 miles away. So if you see Abraham taking his son Isaac, up on a mountain and Isaac is bearing wood on his shoulders what's that a sign of? Altar. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. All those things. Son of God. The wood of the cross. The sacrifice. Sign. 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 And if you took it in a literal sense you don't get any of that. And that's heresy. According to the church. Not only the text of Scripture, but the realities and events in which it speaks can be signed. Allegorical sense. We can acquire a more profound understanding of the events by recognizing the significance in Christ. How does this relate to Christ and His life and what He taught us? Thus, the crossing of the Red Sea is a sign or type of Christ's victory and we call it Christian baptism. <coughs> Are we all on the same page? Okay, good. Because you're going to be need. I'm going to pick people to teach this class next week. Uh -huh. Bill's smiling. He's ready. Maybe not. <laughs> right. Two, the moral sense. The events reported in Scripture ought to lead us to act right. 
justly. To change the way we understand our morals. Right? As Paul says, they were written for our instruction. Three, the anagogical sense. Leading. That's what the word means. Leading. We can review, or we can view realities and events in terms of their eternal. So, <laughs> what's the purpose of Scripture, ultimately? To get us to heaven. It's leading us. And we will see in Scripture all these signs that are leading us. So we always have to keep heaven in mind. We should think about heaven every day. We don't always do that, but we should. And the Scripture really encourages us to put all of Scripture in context with leading us to heaven. Wow! How many are learning something this morning? Okay, three. That's good. Three <laughs> people. Thus the church on earth is a sign of heavenly Jerusalem. 18, 118, a medieval couplet summarizes the significance of the four senses. And here's what that couplet says. The letter speaks of deeds, allegory to faith, the moral how to act, anagogy. Our destiny. Heaven. That's just a little couple. Of, that's been around in the church for a long time. Let's see if they... I've got a note on where that came from. Uh, Augustine of... Uh, Dacia? Is there two, two Augustines? Augustine of Hippo and Augustine of... You know all those Augustines. Now, I want to show you something. And this, this may not be for everybody, but I'm going to show it to you today. I finally complained, complained enough to uh, Bible programs that were out there that were not geared towards Catholic. And I, I wrote letters telling them, you can't, you can't put out this Bible program and ignore the Catholics. Well... Before I became Catholic, Logos came out with their Catholic version of everything in their Bible program. Everything they, if you buy their boom, which is their Catholic version of Logos, everything in it is Catholic. And it's all connected. So here, I bring up... <laughs> I love this. we got just enough time. I have pulled up over here on the left the parable of the prodigal and his brother, Luke 15, 11. The story right out. And this is the RSV, Rise Standard Version, 2nd Edition, Catholic Version of the Bible. But guess what I put right next to it that I could do this in a Bible program? The Ignatius Catholic Study Bible, the New Testament. And these are connected. So if I move one, the other starts to move. If I, if I move back, the other starts to move back. So they're connected. What's on the middle there are the notes. And these notes were written by Scott Hahn and several other scholars. So every time you're reading the Bible, then you're getting all kinds of information over here in the middle while you read. <laughs> and you can stop and look what's going on. You can see here that it's... <laughs> It's telling you, okay, verses 11 through 32, the parable of Christ's Son reveals the boundless mercy of God. Though our sins offend the Father, He is ever willing to show us compassion and restore us to family life. In many ways, the parable narrates the continuing struggles of the spiritual life where conversion and repentance are an ongoing process. At another level, the parable narrates the exile and eventual homecoming of historical Israel. So it's really letting you understand, why did Jesus teach this parable? What is this all about? Why are we doing this? It's incredible what's available to us. And then if I'm, if I'm preparing for class, I can simply type in over here Luke 15, 11 through 32, and I hit copy, and I open up my Word document, and it pops it in there, right there. It's an incredible program. Now, 
It's a little pricey. <laughs> I, I don't recommend it for everybody, but if you have any interest at all at really becoming more learned in the Scripture, to me it's worth the money. And so here we go. So, <clears throat> and, and here's, here's, here's kind of how I think about things as I'm reading the Bible. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the property that falls to me. And he divided his living and men. I stop right there. Share of property, right over here on the middle part. What's it say? It was unusual and even shameful for a son to demand his inheritance before his father's death. See, if you just read that out of Scripture, you might not get that feel of that. He just embarrassed his father. And he's demanding something that no son should ever demand. In other words, he's saying, you're not dying fast enough. I want my stuff. And we need to feel that. When we get to... <laughs> well, let's go on. <clears throat> And when, this is down on 14, and when he had spent everything, let me back up a little bit. When he had spent everything, a great famine arose in the country, and he began to be in want. So he went and joined himself, that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Joined himself. Wow. And he went and joined himself to, to one of the citizens of the country, who sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he gladly, he fed on the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Yes? Where do you get this, and what is it called? It's called Logos, it's Verbum in Logos Study Bible. Verbum, V-E-R-B-U-M. And it's a totally Catholic study program that is amazing. Anyway. Where do you get it from? <coughs> Well, you can just Order it. Google it. Ah. And it'll come up. And they'll show Verboom you if you want to buy it. You, yeah. It's called Verboom, V R B U M, from Logos, L O G O S. So, when I first read this, I had an experience in my life that changed the way I understood this scripture. I could smell this man. How many have been around pigs? When I was about 14 years old, I went out to a buddy's house. He was out on a farm. They had pigs. They had cattle. And we were shooting sparrows with uh, 22, well, sparrows to, to a farmer ruins their, their machinery. That's why they kill them. But anyway, we're shooting sparrows, and I, I saw a couple of sparrows over in a tree in a I saw the pig pen right here, and so I just, I walked out on this area that I thought was solid ground. <laughs> Little did I know, for years they had been pushing all the pig manure, and it was the fall of the year and all the leaves were down. I sunk to my hips in the pig manure. And then I lost my balance. <laughs> Threw the gun over my head. I was to, to my shoulders. I can smell it to this day. And when I read that scripture, my heart breaks for this man. He's in pig muck. He smelled. He's at the bottom. But what does the father do? What does the father do? He sees him from afar off and he runs and it'll say in those notes in the middle part, seniors did not run in those days. That was not honorable. He ran and he, he says, <laughs> the Greek underneath it says he fell on his neck and kissed him. And I'm thinking, oh my Lord. 
Bring the robe. Bring the sandals. Bring the ring. Cover this boy. Put those sandals on his feet. Why? Because slaves were bare feet, not sons. This scripture just comes alive for me. I can smell it. I can, I can see that old man running and the tears going down his cheek. And I can see the party going on. Kill the fatted calf. And I can see the elder son coming in. And the arrogance of that older brother. How dare you have a party? He, he squandered his inheritance. What kind of a father is this? And who is this? So who is this father of Sinai? Our heavenly father. This is what Scott and Mike are talking about in the passion of the Scripture. This is how we read the Bible. This is how we begin to understand the Bible. And if we can get scholars like this that can give us opportunities of their knowledge as well, right side by side, man, I bought that in a heartbeat. And it really helps me prepare for class. There's so many things that are Catholic that I don't understand yet, seven years in. I need this. In fact, I was glad I got to go to the master's program because I was just Catholic enough to be dangerous. <laughs> Jesse. No, but see, it's important to underscore that all of those senses of Scripture apply. So to really unpack the meaning of any single verse, you can use all of those senses of Scripture. And so you can be a scholar and still be unpacking meaning you know, it's, it's not like, well, I've been a Catholic 25, 30, 50 years, now I get it. You know, we're dealing with infinite realities, so even if you are a scholar, you're still standing on the edge of the seashore, looking at the top of the ocean, because God always leads you in deeper. We have to have all those senses of Scripture to truly get it, because we have an infinite God talking to us. And that really shows the, the faulty approach in a lot of Protestantism, there's a kind of relativism which says, well, what does this mean to you? Exactly. <laughs> and it ignores the whole tradition in that whole body and all of those senses that we need to understand fully even one verse of Scripture. You know. So just, again, more context there. i got to run, but yeah. Well, and it wasn't until I became Catholic that I realized what a ter terrible heretic I was. Uh -huh. I had a lot of heresies in my in my life. Jackie and I were dealing with all kinds of heresies. We didn't know it. How would we do it? Until we got to the Catholic Church. This is, this, here, here's what I pray for all of us. This is what I pray. we got to get hungry. we got to get hungry. And Lent is a perfect season to do that. We have to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And you say, well, I, I don't think I'm hungry. I don't, how do you get hungry? Pray for it. Pray for it. Laura? Oh, I wasn't going to say that. Yeah. We need to pray for that. We're living in a society that becomes so apathetic. And there is a fire in the belly. You can see it in Paula. You can see it in Marcella. You can see it in Didymus. You can see it in all the saints. They had a fire in their belly. Get me to Mass. And how long can you, will you let me stay? Talk to me after this Mass is done. I want to know more and more and more and more and more. Challenging. Challenging. Praise God. Did you learn anything this morning? Yes. Yeah. yeah. These notes will get out there. I'm way behind. I'm sorry I'm way behind uh, on getting stuff out on the website, but I'll get them out there. And, uh, yes. 
I happened to be watching yesterday on the Bishop there. Yeah. I did talk on the real presence in the Eucharist, and I would encourage everybody. You can that YouTube is, that. It's an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. Bishop Barron speaks on the real presence. In fact, Bishop Barron speaks on every subject known to man. <laughs> if you want to type in anything, you'll, yeah. you'll come up and you'll get a five to seven minute deal on what he teaches, and it is powerful. It really is. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord God, we open our hearts and minds to you this morning. Holy Spirit, precious Holy Spirit, make us hungry and thirsty for the righteousness that you give to us in such a precious and holy gift. Father, we thank you for this church that your Son established on the earth over 2,000 years ago. Lord, we don't want to live lives of apathy. Don't let us be lazy. Let that fire burn in our belly. And we thank you, Lord, for all the things you provide. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the opportunity to meet with this class. Thank you for all the things, that, for Curcio and all the other different things available to us to build our faith and to help us be more like you, Jesus, each and every day. And we thank you for it. We praise you for it. As we pray, our Father, who Lord art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. See you next week.